This is Ready News Review, the podcast. And now, America's independent voice, Rob Ready. Rob Ready. Talking tough with Dr. Tommy Curry. Dr. Tommy Curry, how are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good, Rob. How are you? Wonderful. Talk to me about what we're talking about. Today we're going to talk about race conscious womanism and the black feminist economic endeavor. Let's do it. All right, so last week I started, I left off with, I guess, uh, a somewhat controversial thesis, um, namely that black feminism uses the race-sex identity uh, to partner with white women for political and economic power. And I argue that what this, in fact, does is it allows them to use gender oppression to hide their economic motivations uh, behind align, aligning themselves with the second most powerful racial group in America. Now... I want to explain something. This is not only a political ideology, but this is also driven by a demographic change in the university. Right now, black women get two-thirds of the PhDs that's award to black people. So even though this is a type of discursive idea that comes about in disciplines like women's studies or black feminism, it's also driven by this demographic fact that you have black women now competing for jobs against black other black men and uh, other white women on these types of issues. Now, there's an obvious reality here uh, that black men black children are subject to the same types of abuses that black women are subject to. So even though black feminism tries to make an exclusive claim to the types of sexual and gender abuses that happen, things like rape, especially prison rape I've mentioned before, child abuse, poverty, these are all things that happen to the black community based on their sexual sexuality in a white supremacist society. Now what black feminism tries to do is it takes us, given that the patriarchal culture that we see in a larger Eurocentric society or white society and the power of white society also translates into the power that black men have over them. So it's the domination of black women uh, by black men. So this is where the idea I've mentioned before that black male privilege gains its ground in the academy. But this is nothing more than a kind of mythology because what happens here is that this is not sociologically proven. It's not. The, it's not like we're holding sociological and economic, uh, you know, conferences or writing papers. To date, there's no peer review paper uh, on black male privilege that actually shows how it benefits black men on the long run. So then, this ideology itself gains footing because what you have is an economic motivation. Black Black women with PhDs trying to fight for limited academic and disciplinary spaces against black male academicians. So there's an economic driving force where black men now become the primary economic competitors in academic spaces with black feminists. So as we know from Reconstruction to now, there's a type of racial scapegoating that goes on that's pushed forward by an economic motivation that aligns with the ideological uh, stereotypes that black people have, or black women, or black feminists in this case have, of other black men. <clears throat> so what we have to think about then is how these economic motivations behind this ideology of black feminism is not only pushing the types of things they put out, but also the analysis they give us of the black community. Now, this differs from a large view from what I'm going to talk about, which is race-conscious womanism. And what happens in the academy is that there's this view that black feminism is the only legitimate way for us to study sexuality and gender. That if you're not a black feminist, then you have everything wrong. But black womanism or race-conscious womanism takes a different view. First, it argues that black men and women have always been partners in the struggle against racism and sexism or what Claudia Jones called racial chauvinism. So what this movement says is that black men are also victimized and disempowered and oppressed in society just like their women are. And this great, differs a great deal from how white feminists looks at the situation because white in a white society, white women are subjected to their men. That's the concept. That is a patriarchal society, so they're being repressed and oppressed by white men. That's not necessarily the case when you look at a black society because in black society you're looking at black men and black women competing for economic goods and economic resources against a dominant white supremacist society that doesn't value the black man or the black woman. So whereas black feminism wants to articulate a kind of bifurcated or an academic language and intersectional identity, womanism is very clear that race and the material conditions of racism and neocolonialism are first and foremost in how we perceive and deal with black existence. So when you think about the people that we talk about for Black History Month, T. Thomas Fortune, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, these individuals were in fact a great, great supporters and advocates of black women's literacy, education, and economic empowerment. For example, Booker T. Washington funded his wife's school, Maggie Washington's uh, in, in industry for uh, home economics. So there's this move that black men see that black women are fundamentally important and central to the idea of black people rising up as a race. Now the problem I have when we talk about black feminism is that there's a type of intellectual dishonesty that exists in the narrative that tells black people generally, that this is out the academy, it wants to tell black people generally that every movement for rights, be it the civil rights movement or the black power movement, was about where black men died and were assassinated at the hands of white people, was fundamentally about black men seeking to dominate 
educating women. Whereas the women's movement, and this is what really gets me, the women's movement that was organized on the back of black people's blood and death against the police, the CIA, and the government, and led by the same middle-class white women who had black mammies and black domestics working for them, and accepted the rape of black women from, re- from slavery all the way to segregation, somehow had the interests of black women at heart. So you have individuals who fundamentally benefited, white women who benefited from the exploitation of black women in the home so they could go to college, so they could get money in the, uh, in the workforce, fundamentally get to say now that, that they've started a movement that you should leave aside the black power movement, the civil rights movement, which was fighting for the integration of people, in the, black people in the United States, and trust their economic interest over in that, against that of the race. And this, you have to really think about this. This is like I was saying last week. There is a tendency for us not to understand the complexity of American racism, where we suggest that every woman, be it a black woman or a white woman, has not been able to be, cannot be held accountable and culpable for the type of racism that goes on in society. So when we talk about what black womanism or race conscious womanism does versus black feminism, we have to keep our mind on the anti-black racist nature and the anti-black violence in society and how black people, the black community, black men and women as a whole chose to respond to that violence. And I think that race conscious womanism centers that kind of reality against the economic driven motivations of the contemporary black feminist movement in the, uh, in the academy today. Well said, Dr. Tommy Curry. Dr. Tommy Curry, how can folks get in contact with you? They can hit me on Twitter at Dr. TJC. You've been listening to Ready News Review, the podcast with America's independent voice, Rob Reddy, presented by Reading Communications Incorporated. For all the pressing news you need to know, log on to www.readingnewsreview.com.